So again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. I think you have all seen the agenda. We have very interesting topics and discussions on the initiatives on this call. And I will not take much of your time before handing over to Alina and Fiona on the GBV and MHPSS uh, really interesting project. But I just wanted to say we are really getting close to the date for the 16 days from 25th of November until 10th of December. And usually each organization, we all have our own initiatives. We all doing many things around those dates. And uh, we, we have started the discussion from our side in GVAR with our regional teams, with our country teams, our members, and also UNFPA to see what makes sense like for the themes of this year. Because usually like the main themes that are announced, we also need to make sure it's something relevant to humanitarian context if we want to adopt and do something about them. So feel free to just write in the chat or write to me if you have any suggestion, if you know your organization are doing something that we can join forces. So that we'll see like in the discussions that we are also having so far, how we can make these linkages between different actors and do something together if possible. And yeah, just wanted to ask this before handing over to Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks, Shiva. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna start off our call with a presentation by two colleagues, um, Fiona Shanahan, and I'm sorry, I probably didn't pronounce your last name right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Anina Potts from GWI um, and Fiona from Troikia. And it's a joint project, which they will um, introduce more in detail, but it's also been supported from its inception by the GBVAOR. And we've also been part of the, um, of the steering committee and both Jennifer, the global coordinator and myself. And so I've um, been part of quite, quite closely this development, this process of um, jointly um, a year-long consensus building process um, between GBV and MHPS actor, as actors. So it's been a really, really rich discussion and interesting process. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing a bit more about both the, um, I think you will be also covering in your presentation, um, the process of the participatory action as well as the findings, right? Yeah, great. So I, I will hand over to you and um really looking forward. Many thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just sorry, I'm getting the presentation up and my computer decided to give me the restart. Do you, do you want to <laughs> screen? Um one second. I can do it. We'll see. Yeah, so it may be, um, Fiona, I will also email to you quickly, Shiva, because I'm a little yeah. worried that it's about to kick me out while I'm opening sure. um, as a backup. Sorry about that, everyone. No worries. Feel free to share, and we can also just share the screen on your behalf. Yeah, no, I am just, uh, just sent it to Shiva. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can start with a bit of background while I'm waiting for the email. Yeah, yeah, so I can start with background. I also, um, it says host participant, disabled participant screen sharing. Mm 
Yeah, you do have the rights to share your screen. Interesting. Um... Yeah, sorry, that's happening to me too. It's saying I can't share my screen. Sorry. Yeah, because I had shared the rights with Alina and she said she's right. But now it should work for both of you. Okay, grant. I'm sorry, I haven't received the presentation yet. Oh yeah, now it. Okay, you can see it now. Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so still kind of on a nice edge because this may cut off at any time. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Um, and let me just which participant view. So just to say, I think many of you have been part of this um, project and I really, you know, it is a very participatory project and we've um, kind of learned immensely from the body of knowledge from both um, GBV and MHPSS actors. And that was really, you know, a distinct part of this process, right? It's really meant to be consensus building um, and it's meant to engage those who work at the front lines of this um, practice, also in policy um, in research as well. Um, so when we're presenting, we're really presenting that greater body of knowledge. It's not something that you know we want to kind of claim as our own, um, but really see ourselves as like shepherds or stewards of this process. So for background, um, and again, sorry for a re repeat for anyone who's heard this before, um, I work with the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University as a research scientist, Fiona, um, works with TROCRA, um, leading their GBV programming, and really, you know, through conversations with within the AOR um, over the last few years, this project was actually several years in the making, um, you know, it was recognized that there was no empirically supported consensus between the sectors around MHPSS for GBV survivors and those at risk. Um, and so from outcomes of conversations within the various coordination bodies, this project um, was put forward to address those critical knowledge gaps and lack of consensus and really come up with um, suggestions for effective interventions uh, for survivors and those at risk through this consensus building process. And it's funded by uh, USAID, by the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Um, so and I'll give an overview of the project activities, um, and then Fiona will do a deeper dive into the resources that this work produced. Um, we first conducted a desk scan of MHPSS for GBV survivors in humanitarian settings, and that full scan is available. Um, I'm happy to share that with anyone who would like to read the full thing. Um, and I'll go over like very quickly some of the, the outcomes of that. But just to say, we also had an advisory group with experts from both sectors, um, about half of which were from women and or youth led organizations. That was very important to us. Um, and we engaged the AOR, other coordination bodies, um, key informants to develop a proposive sample of GBV and MHPSS experts and service providers representing a really broad swath of different contexts, experiences um, to enroll in the Delphi study. And um, I'll explain, I know that sounds maybe like a little bit of jargon, but I'll also explain what that means in a, in a moment. Um, so in addition to this Delphi study process, we also held consultations throughout at subnational, national and regional levels um, this was, began in Myanmar with a virtual consultation due to some security concerns, um, also in the ghetto region of Somalia and in East Africa held in Nairobi. Um, so that with this online Delphi study kind of survey process, that was, you know, these in-person consultations were happening to kind of keep grounding the findings and checking in um, with, you know, those working on these areas. Um, and then finally, we took the learning and developed um, a series of actionable evidence-based guidance notes and learning briefs that we'll go over. Um, so you can see in the end, we um, you know, had quite a large number of people participating in different rounds. I'll show those numbers also. Um, and we held many, many consultations um, in the areas where we worked. So this is just a visual to really kind of put all those pieces together on a timeline. Um, so you can see if you read it from the top, um, it kind of goes like down, up, down, up, down. So we had the Myanmar consultation. We used that to develop round one of the Delphi survey. 
Um, we also sent on a baseline survey because um, BHA really, you know, wanted to see kind of what are on your key outcomes, how do they change from baseline to end line. Um, the Delphi survey itself, the first round went out in July of, of last year, and that was 27 questions. It was open-ended. They were within 12 themes identified in the literature review. And the feedback from that um, was to further discussed at the Samaya consultation to review the themes and develop round two of the survey. Um, now, this is where the Delphi, kind of the uniqueness of the Delphi process comes in. So in round two, um, all of that qualitative information is used to develop statements. So statements of best practice or statements of what's not best practice. And then the respondents can use a Likert scale to say either I strongly agree, you know, somewhat agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree with each statement. So each statement kind of gets a rank and we can see how many people agree or strongly disagree with the statement and how pe many people disagree or strongly disagree. Um, the regional consultation in Nairobi was held and the findings from round two were reviewed and then that supported the development of round three. So at round three, each participant can then see the score that each statement received. So, you know, from strongly disagree being one to strongly agree being five, what's the average score? And they have the opportunity to either keep their score or change it. And this is where we can see, like among a group of experts, consensus being built because they can see without kind of, you know, all of this is anonymized, but understanding, okay, the wider group of experts is here. Do I, do I also want to stay where I am? Maybe I'm here or do I kind of come towards agreement with the, with the group of experts, um, which I am part of. And so in Washington, D.C., this April, we held a global consultation to validate the findings and to really talk about the guidance notes to kind of put forward the drafts and outlines that we developed and get feedback on them and make sure that they were um, useful and you know understandable, et cetera. Throughout, we've had key engagements with the AOR, with the MHPSS reference group and task team and the advisory group. Um, so just this is just to show kind of overall for the literature review, you know. At the very beginning, we start off with over 10,000 hits, basically remove duplicates, all the things you normally do. Um, ended up with 127 studies that we included for background and 25 studies that we included where there was primary data reported on an MHPSS intervention with GBV survivors in humanitarian settings. Um, and so within the literature review, these were the themes that emerged and these were the groupings that we then used for round one of the Delphi study. Um, and then you'll see some of these that just changed color. These areas in the end, we ended up including in what we're calling our overview document, which Fiona will talk about briefly. And the ones that I've outlined are where we, um, because of the degrees of consensus around good practice, not good practice, we developed five learning briefs and guiding notes, guidance notes on these areas. Now, medication in particular surfaced some need for further discussion, and that's been followed up. Um, Trocar has taken on the lead and following that up with other key actors. And then um, we didn't get into addressing so much social behavior change interventions or healthcare. Um, there's a lot of text on this slide, but generally, just to show you the diversity of those included in the Delphi study, it was in five languages. So all the materials went out in all of these languages. Um, the majority of respondents had six to 10 years or 11 or more years, so very experienced, predominantly working with INGOs and UN, followed by women-led organizations, activists, and then national or local or organizations. And, you know, importantly, there was a relatively even split in the sectoral focus between GBV and MHPSS. You see, we have a tremendous diversity of countries, um, you know, mostly internationally focused, but a good number locally and regionally focused. So it works out kind of more than half were locally or regionally focused. And then a range of roles, right? From technical advice, program management, coordination, advocacy, service delivery, um, and the majority of people of people responding reported participating in two or more coordination mechanisms. So they are engaged and involved in the sectoral conversations going on. Um, and just to say, we had pretty good response rates. I mean, anyone who's ever done a survey knows that you spend a lot of time following up with people. Um, you know, the biggest drop, obviously, from those invited 
to the baseline and kind of getting into round one. But once people were engaged in round one, round two, round three, we saw a lot of um, commitment to finishing that process. And these were not the shortest surveys. So we really appreciate that. Um, so this, um, just to say, and we'll be also sharing a paper that will really do a deep dive into the methodology, but um, the levels of agreement. So people um, for these different themes, you can see that from 75% and up was agreement. So 75 to 84 agree, 85% or higher, we consider strongly agree. So you can see there's a lot of agreement here um, in general on these areas. And then if we look at, um, again, here, we can see like, for example, um, sometimes there's really high uh, disagreement, but that also is a consensus, right? Because it's a consensus around what not to do. So when it comes to mediation, and this really refers to couples and family interventions, there was a high, agree, high degree of agreeing what is not best practice. Um, so I kind of go through that quickly because what we really want to focus on today is the resulting guidance from this year long consensus building process. Um, so I will now hand over to Fiona to talk more about that. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'll be taking through you through the results. Um, and we have developed uh, the resulting guidance really guided by our advisor group. So of GBV and MHPSS actors, Half of our advisory group members are um, women-led organizations or um, women and youth-led organizations. And we use the results of the study along with consultations held in Myanmar, Somalia, and the consultation of regional actors in East Africa to develop guidance on best practices for survivor-centered MHPSS in emergencies. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention my colleagues um, on the TROPA side who've been supporting this process, particularly Priya Joshi, who coordinates this project and the TROPA component of it, um, and who was unfortunately unable to join, and then also Helen Nickonry and Vicky Tallis, who've been supporting throughout. So what we have is five learning briefs and guidance notes, and those are on the topics that Alina ran through, but I'm just going to mention them again. Um, so the five core topics are couples and family interventions. So particularly, what do you do when it emerges that there is gender-based violence happening within a relationship or within a dynamic and you're offering psychosocial support to that couple, for example. Um, use of transdiagnostic approaches where that might include GPV survivors. Use of exposure techniques with GPV survivors. Um, child and adolescent survivors. So support to child and adolescent survivors and managing risks of suicide. So those are the five core areas. And then we also have an overview document, as Alina mentioned, and this goes through key structures and resources, the centrality of GBV case management when it comes to supporting survivors in humanitarian settings, and particularly GBV case management as a core MHPSS intervention as well. Key terminology, methodology, core concepts and guiding principles and roles and responsibilities. And the resources are available in Arabic, English, French, Somali, and Spanish. And our Burmese resources should be online in, in the next few days. So they're nearly there. One key thing from the overview document was our core guiding principles. Um, and so there was a high level of agreement across our sample on these principles and that these different sets of principles should underpin and ground all our support to um, GPV survivors in humanitarian settings. And these are GPV guiding principles, MHPSS core principles, humanitarian principles, feminist approaches and trauma-informed care. So there's a lot in this. The point really is that there's so much commonality. There's a huge amount of, um, kind of what unites us across these different bodies of principles that people might be using. And a key perspective here is that although we come from different professional backgrounds and those professions have different histories and so different language, um, there is still, it is still important to show how much commonality there is and, and that there is a lot of consensus in terms of values and approaches. Um, this project really focuses quite a bit on the areas where there weren't consensus and trying to address those, um, but just to acknowledge that there's lots of areas in which, in which we do already have consensus between our fields as well. And our sample, those who have been kind of directly engaged, our participants, were very clear that 
anyone who is working to support GPV survivors in humanitarian settings, um, particularly providing MHPSS care, should be grounded by these principles and should be working in line with these principles. So if we just move to the next one. I'm just going to give a quick overview of what's in the learning series. So first of all, we have the guidance notes. There's three of those. Um, and we have one on couples and family interventions, use of transdiagnostic approaches and exposure techniques. And guidance notes are really documents that introduce new guidance. So these are areas where we had very high levels of consensus um, on do's and don'ts, like very clear guidance to service providers that we don't currently have, that currently isn't in existing um, resources or bodies of knowledge within our sector. And if we move to the next slide, the learning briefs are on the other two topics. And the learning briefs are on child and adolescent survivors and managing risk of suicide. And these are areas where we had very high levels of consensus, but the consensus was perhaps on statements around need for training, need for resources, need for access to existing guidance. And so the learning briefs really respond to that need, that kind of clearly expressed need. Um, rather than introducing necessarily a large amount of new guidance. And then for each of those five topics, we have the note itself, so the document that goes into a lot of detail and also includes a scenario for more kind of contextual thinking through the topic, um, an infographic, so a poster that summarizes key messages, and a video that goes through key messages as well and includes different experts um, talking about the key messages and explaining aspects of them. Now, so where to get them? So there is a public box folder where everything in all the different languages is available. And we can pop that link in the chat. Um, it's also on the Global Women's Institute website and there are videos, all the different explainer videos are on the YouTube channel. And these resources will soon be up on the GPVAOR website as well, and the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Minimum Services Package website. And then we were hoping to just take you into a couple of the infographics, just to give you a sense of what's in there in terms of some of the content of the guidance. And so we'll maybe start with exposure techniques. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and so, Exposure techniques. So Elena's just going to pull this up on the screen, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll just maybe start talking through it. Um, so first of all, in the infographic, we start with a definition. And so exposure techniques are psychological treatment techniques where you're attempting to support someone within the context of a psychosocial intervention to um, be exposed to or come into contact with in some way something that they greatly fear. So imaginal exposure is where you would ask someone to recall or possibly describe in great detail a potentially traumatic event or in vivo exposure would be where you would support someone to in some way directly face a feared situation or activity or object where that situation or activity is in fact safe. So where they have a fear in relation to it, but it is actually a safe activity. So these are techniques that are used within a range of different kinds of psychological interventions or psychological therapies. Um, when they're used in humanitarian settings, they can be used in a range of different types of contexts. So it, it might be within the context of a particular intervention, or it might be that the technique is being used in some sort of other way. This guidance applies to any time that an exposure technique is used. Um, and really what this guidance relates to is when working with GBV survivors in a humanitarian setting, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate in relation to the use of these techniques. Um, so it starts with a little bit of a description around what you'd normally want to have in place when using this, this type of technique um, within psychological support, so making sure that you're able to conduct a proper stabilization phase with the person, making sure that there's a strong therapeutic relationship, making sure that their ongoing um, life circumstances are conducive to doing this kind of work, that they're experiencing safety, stability, that they have access to good coping resources, all that kind of thing. And then how tricky that is in a humanitarian setting. 
And a lot of this comes directly from people's qualitative responses in terms of their own experience of, of these sorts of techniques being used. And so then I'll just highlight a couple of do's and don'ts. So the do's are things like ensuring physical and psychological safety of TPV survivors is the first priority for all service providers and also around assessing safety, including assessing risks of ongoing harm or ongoing violence before engaging in any intervention. And then some of the don'ts here that again came out very strongly with high levels of consensus, um, don't use exposure techniques within group sessions in humanitarian settings. Um, and then recommending that service providers remove the exposure element if they're doing a transdiagnostic intervention that uses an exposure element to it or has an exposure component to it. Um, so that's just to give you a bit of an idea of what the infographics look like, the kind of guidance that's in there, how they're laid out. Um, I think in the interest of time, we could look very quickly at the couples and family one. Um, so again, just to show this is drawing on some of the knowledge and, and very kind of clear guidance that we have in relation to mediation. And then thinking that through when you're looking at a couple's intervention. So couples counseling, couples therapy, um, different terms can be used for that. But a time when a psychosocial practitioner or um, an MHPSS worker or another humanitarian staff member is taking the role of an impartial third party with a couple where there's violence in that relationship. So where it emerges that um, the intervention is actually being offered to a survivor and perpetrator. What do you do in that situation? So really kind of practically thinking through how do you minimize potential risks? Um, how do you kind of shift to offering individual support to the survivor, um, assessing the best strategy with your supervisor in terms of safety, while also ensuring that you're not creating more risk with the um, potentially abusive partner, um, ensuring safety becomes the highest priority, which again, received very, very, very high levels of consensus across all participants. Um, and then kind of very clear guidance around not intervening um, or mediating, not taking that impartial third party role where there is a survivor and perpetrator participating in an intervention, not including perpetrators of GPV in the same MHPSS intervention with GPV survivors where that is known. And there are many cases where that is known and there isn't clear guidance or, or there hasn't thus far been clear guidance about what to do in those situations. So a lot of people also had experiences of that um, and we're asking for, for much more clarity in relation to guidance on that. So that's what, um, and now on the infographic, it's, it's a lot less detailed than it is in the guidance note, um, but it does give you a sense of what kind of guidance is coming through. Um, and also the clarity that we were able to get to in terms of the consensus that was reached across the group. Um, so just to wrap up, I wanted to briefly mention some of our proposed follow on work. Um, so the, these are things that we would hope to do. Um, and this is some of this is funding dependent, but I thought it'd be good to kind of give this group a bit of a sense of where we hope this work is going. Some key things will be around dissemination with GBVAORs and MHPSS technical working groups at national and subnational levels, particularly in you know, a, a wider range of countries that weren't directly involved in the consultations, integrating the guidance within relevant initiatives and resource packages, and some of that has started already. And then we'd also like to facilitate a series of dialogue sessions and peer professional development spaces with groups of service providers in humanitarian settings to support ongoing improvements in practice, coordination and mutual understanding. And this is something that came out very strongly in the national consultations as well as, as something that people would like to see going forward. And developing further resources and interactive tools in response to needs identified by service providers. Um, we have scenarios within the existing resource package, but building out on the range of scenarios that we can explore and making them more contextually relevant. And so on the final slide, I've just put up some of our um, key contact information for people who'd like to get in touch. And I think we possibly have some time for questions. So I might hand back over to you, uh, Shiva or Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Fiona. Thank you, Lina. And yes, we have some time. So if there's any questions in the group, um, thanks for this very rich presentation. Um, I think there's so much more to be said, but um, I... 
I really encourage everyone to have a look at the resources because from a learning perspective, I must say like my personal feedback is it's it's brilliant. I think having the having the the essentials kind of boiled down in the infographics and really being to the point brief, I think that's so helpful to kind of um make that message um approachable and then also having the scenarios to think it through. Um, because oftentimes I, I feel like these are the kind of things that I'm just talking while you guys can can sign up if you have any um if, if you have any questions or also pop it into the chat. But yeah, I find it so useful if you have a scenario as well to think it through and and see how how these concepts apply in practice because sometimes you can think it's so clear, but then when when you come in the nitty gritty, and I think that's something I took away from the process when you take it apart and you really think through what it means in practice. Um, that's when when the tricky elements come out. Um, yeah. So do do we have any questions from the group? Otherwise, we can also um, we will disseminate the the PowerPoint as well with the notes. So then if you have any follow-up um, questions or queries or want to get in touch, you can reach out to Fiona and Alina as well. Stephanie, sorry, I may have missed it, but I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the presentation and the work that was indeed very interesting. Uh, I just was wondering, is there um, the plan of having a training package associated to it? Maybe you have said that, but I may have missed it, sorry. Yeah, that I think um, kind of falls under the follow on proposed follow on work that Fiona shared at the end. Um, we have put in a concept note for further funding to further disseminate these resources and develop, you know, accompanying, um, for example, a training package could be one of those needs identified. So we're keeping fingers crossed. Um, but that's at the very initial stages of just submitting the concept note. So we're not sure yet. But I do think, you know, we are members of these coordination mechanisms. And so we really want to support kind of uptake however we can, even if that funding doesn't come through. Um, but actually kind of, you know, being able to develop new resources would probably be dependent on that. Um, but they are also being included on the MHPSS minimum service package website. And really the idea is that they're kind of can be integrated into some of the trainings and activities that both sectors are undertaking. Um, also, um, there's some other MHPSS training that, um, you know, packages that they're being potentially incorporated into. So we are always available to, to brainstorm or think about how to include them in existing um, initiatives as, as well. Um, and Oswald, can you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I have a question, a question of curiosity. Uh, I don't know if you are all at uh, UNHCR, uh, IRC, and I think as a international NGO and agency, UN agency are currently developed a protection case management guidelines. I don't know how you are involved in the process, but uh, I know that there will be a part, uh, a part uh, about the uh, mental health and psychosocial support. Uh, when I hear Drew, you, I, I, I think you offer this, the point that the centrality of GPP case management uh, is very important in mental health and psychosocial support. Uh, so is this something do you think you will consider in the protection case management guidelines also? Um, so I'm not personally involved in that, Fiona, I don't know if you have more to share there, but I mean, I would really support these being used, you know, and referenced within that, um, within protection case management resources. I think, um, you know, I, we showed the infographic in detail, which is very kind of quick and to the point. Um, maybe I'll just quickly, very, very quickly show you the out, how the, fuller guidance notes and learning briefs are laid out, but, you know, they kind of talk about the issue, they provide links to existing guidance and resources on that issue, 
Um, they have key messages in more detail than what you see in the infographics. And I think one thing Stephanie highlighted is we have scenario-based learning for applying the key messages. So everyone has a scenario, you know, really meant to reflect the complex cases that, um, that we see in humanitarian settings with some questions and then also what the learning points from the scenario were. And then just, you know, a bit at the end about how it was developed. So I think um, just thinking about that in terms of both the training and the case management questions, you know, I think there's a lot there that you could use um, to do some training, to kind of provide guidance to case managers, to provide areas of competency maybe that are assessed. Um, I think it could be really useful. Fiona, did you want to add? Mm -hmm. Really briefly, just to say that there has been um, some linkages in relation to that work. Um, IRC were on the advisory committee for this project. Um, and then I know that the GBVAOR and the MHPSS task team have also been linking with the group who are working on the protection case management guidelines. Um, so yeah, I would hope that elements of this guidance can be integrated there. Um, I would say that our, the, the use of these guidance notes, they are on very specific issues. So they do work best when integrated into kind of a range of different bodies of guidance. So that's the route that we're hoping to take. Um, so integrating as much as possible into existing trainings, existing guidance and resources, and then developing, when we develop trainings, developing modules that can be used very easily within a range of different types of settings. Um, so, so that's the hope and, and thanks very much for the interest on it. We can keep in touch. Yeah, thank you both. And just to reiterate, indeed, um, GPVAUR has been approached by Protection Case Management to be part of the steering committee of developing it. And we have a couple of core members that also signed up as um, focal points so we can make sure that this guidance and other relevant guidance is integrated in the process. So that will be hugely useful for that as well, especially on the medi mediation part. I think that always comes up um, as a contentious issue. So thank you very much. If there's one last question, perhaps we can take it. Otherwise, um, we will have to move on to the next point as well. I think this hand is probably still up from your last question, right? Yeah, OK. So otherwise, maybe if there's more questions, um, put it in the chat and we can also um, get back to you. But in the interest of time, we'll have to move on now um, to have a spotlight on Tigre region. And as you know, we sometimes will have um, focal, uh, a focus on newly emerged crisis and emergencies and briefings on that. But of course, we also don't want to forget about ongoing emergencies. And so we are welcoming today um, Kali, who is from um, FHI 360. Kali owns um, apologies. And she is with us today to brief us. She went on mission in August um, and can tell us a bit more about FHI 360's work and the situation in Tigray region. Over to you, Carly. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you, Shiva, for organize, organizing and also Alina and Fiona. That's an excellent presentation and brilliant work you guys are doing. I can't wait to see more of it. OK, let me share my screen. It's been a while since I've used Zoom. Um, okay. All right, is that okay for everyone? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, so um, today I will go over um, a recent mission that I took to the Tigray region for the month of August. Um, Last year I was in Amhara because Tigray was not accessible. And then this year it kind of switched while I was there. Um, conflict started breaking out again in the Amhara region. So I was focusing mainly on Tigray. So I'll give a very, very brief overview of FHI 360 just because we're not necessarily known um, as a huge humanitarian actor. So I'll give you a briefing as to why I'm here today and why our crisis response team exists. So FHI 360 is a very large organization. We have about 4,000 employees um, who focus mainly on development work. Uh, we have a lot of HIV programming and research and, and things like this. Um, we recently established in the past seven years a crisis response team so that we could sort of like link up the good work that FHI 360 is doing in development 
with um, emerging prices and, you know, figuring out that nexus and also being able to pivot from development to prices. So there are about 12 of us at HQ, teeny tiny team. Um, we have four technical pillars, health, nutrition, protection, and wash. So we try to enter each crisis um, with those four pillars. So we do have that in um, Northern Ethiopia at the moment, and I'll go through that in a bit. So GBV and emergency is programming. We currently have Ethiopia, Nigeria, uh, and Ukraine. We do some work in Yemen. We wrapped up some projects in, um, in DRC, Mozambique, in, and sorry, Afghanistan. So we have a lot of focus on LGBTQIA, elderly persons, unaccompanied children, but the majority of our programming uh, deals with um, adults 18 and above. We also have a strong emphasis on um, PSCA, sexual exploitation and counter trafficking, um, also conflict related sexual violence. All right, so emergency programming in Northern Ethiopia, we focus on three regions, that's Tigray, Amhara and Afar. Uh, again, GBV programming focuses mainly on case management and the individual and um, safe spaces. We operate through one-stop centers, which are government-owned entities, um, usually in the vicinity of hospitals and medical clinics. So that's the best way for us to um, sort of reach clients directly. So we either uh, implement case management directly or we um, train ministry staffs in order for them to provide the quality case management and of course we use the same global guidelines and you know that the GBV AOR uses so last year or up until now sir, we've reached about a thousand cases um, and we began shortly after or during the conflict in March 2021. So apologies for my little paint by number map here but in the Tigray region, um, the red stars are where we are focusing on currently, um, where a lot of the conflict took place last year, and um, many of these areas are only recently accessible. Um, so, you know, they range in, in need um, and, and severity and things. So I'll go over that. But um, essentially, it's Axum, Adigrat, Mikele. And then down there where you see the orange, um, we're taking scoping missions to Mai Chow and Honi. Currently, um, you know, some light to wash activities, but we have been doing assessments um, on protection. And just so you know, the, the presentation that I'm giving you today is, you know, very much my observations, the observations of my staff. Um, there was no formal assessment. Um, typically our crisis response team, we go into conflicts and we just do like a very quick um, assessment. So mainly it's qualitative in nature. So a lot of focus group discussions, key informant interviews and things like this, and really hearing the words from our staff and speaking to um, mainly IDP persons themselves. Um, so just so you know, you know, everything I say today, um, it's definitely not necessarily factual. It's just a lot of observations from uh, a very uh, quick trip to the youth region. So in Tigray, as I mentioned, we have the three locations providing GBV case management, awareness raising, um, you know, your standard GBV programming. Um, what's a bit unique about SHI is that we have direct links to, you know, hospital staff and uh, wash activities. So in that way, it's easier for us and, and quicker to refer clients to multiple different services. Um, we focus on clinical management of rape, STI treatment, antenatal care, and then we also have um, psychiatrists and things on board. <clears throat> I'm not going to say that that's super successful. It looks great on paper, um, but you know, integration on the ground is very difficult. Um, we have our own internal challenges, as every organization does. Um, you know, I can't always say that the integration works perfectly well and there might be like a, a water crisis that breaks out over here. So the wash team will have to focus there and not on the OSC. So, you know, it works, um, but probably not as, as good as it looks, you know, on paper. But I would say the sexual reproductive health is, um, that's functioning quite well. <clears throat> so again, some of my observations and speaking with the team and focus group discussions and speaking with some um, IDP persons, you know, in this in this region, the GBV is rampant, um, both within IDP and host communities. Um, 
the hospital staff that we spoke to who received the patients, um, they reported that domestic violence, intimate partner violence and rape were just very, very prevalent um, pre-conflict and that it's only been, you know, exacerbated based on, you know, the factors that we're all used to hearing. <clears throat> um, Conflict-related sexual violence, uh, you know, was often reported. Um, I believe that there was a mission and report uh, recently or last year on conflict-related sexual violence in order to, you know, escalate that in terms of violations of human rights and things. We did take part in that, but obviously we were not able to share any data or anything like that. Um, some of the OSCs that we visited, they did range in quality, uh, but some areas, and again, this is anecdotal and observations that um, it was reported that it's it's quite common and sometimes acceptable for men and women to have multiple sexual partners, um, even if they're married. And uh, safe sex was not practiced. practiced. And uh, condoms, they were available um, you know, STI tests and things like this, but um, the condoms, they they were not used to my knowledge and it's just not common practice in that community and we're not quite sure why. So for these reasons, there's a very high prevalence of HRV and STIs, um, so much so that, you know, we're not even like aware of, of the numbers and, you know, HRV and STIs is, is one of our specialties, but we just, because like some of the numbers are so high and that, um, capacity and structures are so low that we're not even able to understand what percentage of the population is experiencing this. But we know, you know, from hospital staffs, speaking with gynecologists and whatnot, that um, the situation is quite dire. Um, one observation that I had uh, regarding abortions, you know, FHI versus D's does not provide them, but, you know, we do in, in, come into contact um, with that realm of practice and just anecdotally, um, I was quite surprised at like sort of the ease with, with which women could get abortions um, very, very early term. Um, and it almost seemed, I mean, it, what, it was pretty acceptable. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting, definitely challenged, you know, my, my notions that I had before um, of the culture. So that's like a, a pretty interesting thing that I learned in all the regions of Ethiopia. Um, that's quite easy to get an abortion at a local clinic. So obviously Northern Ethiopia and Tigray specifically, extremely uh, difficult context to operate in for multi multiple reasons. And I'm you know, very proud of our staff, I'm very proud of all the partners that work there and the caseworkers because you know some of the IDP camps that I visited um, is probably like the worst condition I've ever seen, you know, in my career, which is pretty bad. Um, so, you know, you have all your operation challenges, um, Tigray, like the network and the internet, it's barely functioning. I couldn't really have any meetings. Um, so like the, the GBV subcluster, they meet in Mekele in person, um, but, you know, that doesn't account for the people working in um, all the other areas of Tigray where they don't necessarily have standard meetings and it's hard for them to be there in person. So I think sometimes, um, you know, those updates and stuff might get a little bit lost. Um, shortage of medication, of course, across the board. Um, integration of sectors is lacking, like I mentioned, even within FHI 360 um, and in other partners that that we witnessed. Um, okay, lack of electricity, portable wa potable water, shortage of food supplies. You know, everyone is very desperate for food right now. Um, WFP, I believe they stopped distributions. When was that? I think over the summer. So that's quite a contentious um, thing right there. And, you know, everyone is quite suffering because it, it seemed to them the perception was uh, the food was just cut off um, you know, very quickly and, and they didn't understand. In terms of how this impacts GBV IE programming, obviously everything does, um, but the OSCs, some of them that I visited, they were good quality um, hospitals as well. And they seem to have recovered um, mainly from the conflict or else like they were not hit. 
Um, but because of a lot of drone strikes, um, you know, in the past years uh, with Tigre, the, the infrastructure and some of the OSCs, honestly, like at least one of them is just non-existent. I'm like this doesn't, it, there's like no walls, no locks, it's like a hornet infestation, um, you know, and obviously protection sector doesn't usually like have money and um, resources and knowledge to like work on infrastructure. So that's something that we need to like, appeal to donors. Luckily, FHI, we do have some of that funding for WASH and health in order to rehabilitate lightly um, some of these centers. So yeah, a lot of looting going on, you know, glass everywhere. Um, yeah, it's some of the OSCs were, were pretty bad. Um, there is still a lot of internal movement. Um, as I mentioned, Amhara um, is not in good shape right now. So that sort of border between Tigre and Amhara, um, there's a lot of conflict happening right now with this causing movement back and forth. So the, um, you know, the migration internally displaced people continues. I think that there's a perception, well, I know, but visiting there that there seems to be this perception that like Tigre is okay now because they're not in an active conflict. And it sort of seems like, you know, some of the humanitarian actors kind of were there and just like, oh, okay, it's okay now. And just, you know, pulled out. And um, it's not really leaving a lot of space for longevity. And it's, um, yeah, it's quite unfortunate. And even more partners uh, are leaving in about six months. So we're gonna try to take over some of that. But you know, funding across the board is um, is declining. Um, yeah, limitation of awareness on GBV from multiple sides, um, from some of the staff working in organizations. Um, you know, a lot of hospital staff. Um, the directors were, you know, men who. Not saying that men don't understand, but that you know they were not really like on board with GBV programming. Um, also, you know, it's understandable because it's it's like, okay, we're approaching you for GVV programming. And though it is very, very important to us and we understand that, um, it's hard for people to understand, you know, when your ceiling is, is falling apart. So, and I, I totally get that. Livelihood opportunities. So um, a lot of us that work in conflict, we're a bit limited from our donors in terms of, again, like sort of promoting or longevity and that space between you know active conflict and then moving towards development. I think we all know the nexus is quite a mystery and, and remains so. Um, but for instance, you know our donors in Ethiopia were very very much focused on that um, initial response, the, the more like life saving responses and things. So it's hard for us to you know really get into the funding of livelihood opportunities, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, because what what is happening to, you know, our GBV survivors and clients after you know they're receiving these services and if they continue to be displaced and not able to return, you know, what what are they going to do? Um, and some of them, you know, they, returning anytime soon is not an option because um, many people that we work with are from, you know, that border uh, with Amhara and it's just, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So on a more positive note, if you will, um, certain ways forward, we need to advocate for survivor needs. Uh, our staff is, is pretty good at this. So when we're speaking about infrastructure and, and wash and health and nutrition, um, they they will try to bring all of these needs to, you know, the, the various clusters that going directly to the wash cluster, for instance, with very specific, this area, this area, this area, um, how wash is impacting GBV with with the lights and the locks and things like that. So sometimes, you know, it works out pretty well, especially if it's just a, a you know, a low cost activity, like adding some locks here to these latrines and, and this camp, you know. Um, so that, that actually has worked. Some of the larger stuff, you know, not as much, but we have been able to fundraise, if you will, you know, like $10,000 to um, fix a latrine in this OSC, for example, which, it gives us more access to the OSC because it makes everyone happy that they know how to go function in their dream. So we need to strengthen relationships with government ministries. Um, 
already I noticed like a lot of GBV partners have a strong relationship with the Ministry of, of Women and Social Affairs, um, but we need to go beyond that uh, because some of the ministry, you know, folks that I talked to in health, for instance, like they were not necessarily on board. So we need to strengthen that relationship. And one way, you know, at least for us at FHI, because we have that internal capacity, is we need to sort of join forces when approaching um, these individuals and activities because all of these needs are in place. So if we sort of join forces, um, you know, with, with the wash folks, and nutrition, and we come together and, you know, um, GBV is very much for us a, a life-saving service. Um, and I think, you know, that will enable those people to get more on board if they if they see that we're trying to approach this holistically um, and, and sort of like help everyone in, in the hospital vicinity, um, not just GBV survivors, even though that is our main focus. <clears throat> We need to advocate for livelihood opportunities and more longer term solutions. Um, you know, for especially for those donors um, who are more focused on the emergency response. But for us, it's just more. It's just as important to be able to continue that. Um, you know, after the initial crisis that scales down. Um, scaling up of GBV case management, either through direct implementation or you know, focusing on the existing capacity of the Ministry of, of Women. Um, they have been asking for a lot of trainings, you know, anywhere from GBV case management to uh, midwifery to, you know, clinical management of rate for the hospitals. So that's something, I'm, Shiva, I'm probably like running out of time, but um, I think I'm done here. But yeah, that's something that could pretty easily um, be advocated for in training is, is quite a low cost activity or it can be um the, the okay yeah. further gbv assessments for instance we just went to my chow and mahoney where it's, it's it's very much in in desperate need in southern tigray so um if we can continue those gbv assessments and i think that's all from my side apologies if i went over thank you no worries all good thank you so much carly thank you so much for for your time and also highlighting the gaps and needs through your presentation. We have held a few global briefings during the early months of the crisis. And uh, yeah, we all know that it's a complicated context. And since then the challenges, like especially the access and the capacity has been raised a lot. And uh, as, as we see, they still persist. So thank you so much for highlighting those again. And I don't know if we have any questions or comments. Anyone recently been to Tigray? Any suggestion for collaboration, joining forces, as Carly said, please feel free to write in the chat or just unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, yes, Ashley, please. Thank you. Lovely to see you, Carly. Um, quick question from my side, when it comes to kind of one-stop centers versus women and girls safe spaces and kind of the split between services, and I, I don't cover Ethiopia, so I'm a little bit ignorant on this. Can you provide a, a bit more insight into what is the best practice moving forward where you're seeing kind of the weight of service provision being provided at and if you have concerns with the current approach one way or another? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Good to see you or hear you. Um in my opinion, you're good. Uh, yeah, so the way that I saw the structures in Tigray, it's it's really hard to conduct uh, UBV case management inside the IDP camps, which is where, you know, we have the women and girls safe spaces. It just, it doesn't meet, you know, global standards. So I haven't seen any, well, maybe in but in Tigray, it just, it, it wouldn't meet any kind of standards. That there's just people walking around everywhere, even if it is a women and girls safe space. It's, it doesn't necessarily also meet the standards, but as much as we can. So for me, the the best route is through the one-stop centers and most of the women and caseworkers and gynecologists that we met there, very high capacity. Um, again, I think it's it's largely due to infrastructure and things that they, that can't, that they can't really manage a lot. But that's definitely the best route. And some of the OSCs are really good, like they're, you know, far away from sort of the public, um, they're not as, like, you know, visible. So 
for me, like, I think we should just use those existing structures rather than come in and, and intervene as foreigners and such. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you so much, Carly. And I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you so much all for joining. And we're going to share the recording again on this one too, just to flag in case anyone has joined recently. Just going to share my screen and... Hey, so the last agenda point, which I know a lot of our GBV actors have been waiting for this, so definitely not least. Uh, and apologies to the presenters and also all of you, since Jennifer and Astrid have been involved in the process of developing uh, this guidance, but they could not be here today due to some last minute changes in their agenda. So from our side, we have been involved to make sure that GBV and PSEA communities are bridged through this guidance note and, uh, and making sure that this guidance fosters the collaboration on risk mitigation and prevention response between the two com community and also to clarify the role of the GBV AUR in creating these referral pathways. I hand over to uh, Christy and uh, Anne Marie. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, uh, thank you. Thanks. And um, hi, everybody, and thank you for uh, having us here on the call today. So I'm Kirsty, and I'm the consultant who has been supporting the steering committee working on the interagency SEA referrals procedures. Um, underneath this sits underneath the technical advisory group for PSEA between Geneva and New York. And also here presenting as well today, I'm joined by my colleague Anne-Marie Connor, who's been leading on the VCA, the Victim Survivor Centered Approach for the ISC, and she sits with the PSCA Championship as well. So today we've just got um, six short slides. We thought uh, we'll go through just an overview of a very kind of top line overview of what the guidance is, how it is relevant to GBV colleagues and where we have been working with the GBV AOR on developing the guidance and then on the next steps. And then we'll give you some time for questions and answers because I think um, I understood there was some uh, a lot of engagement in the past and there'll be some, some good discussions coming up. So um, next slide, please. Yes, just um, in terms of the overall background to this, there was the 2021 PSEA external review that was undertaken by the Interagency Standing Committee. And one of the areas they looked at was the referral of um, SEA cases from between agencies. And formally it was underneath the umbrella of the interagency community-based complaints mechanism, which I know many of you will have engaged with and worked with. So that was formally under the IACBCM. And one of the main recommendations from the ISC PSEA review on when it was interagency referrals of, um, of cases was to do with making sure that the extensive guidance from 2016 for the CBCM was simplified and it also was updated to reflect new roles, um, not least with, with GBV colleagues, but new roles and responsibilities and as well um, a much stronger uh, survivor-centered approach, the new policy and guidance that's come out with that, for including the one that Amari led, but also um, documents like the UN Victim Assistance Protocol. So the briefing or the mandate that was given to the specific steering committee under the PSCA Technical Advisory Group, under the deputies of the Interagency Standing Committee, was to simplify the existing guidance and to update it with a survivor-centered approach. So um, we uh, then spent the last year, and in particular the last eight months, um, working together with the aim of making sure that whenever an SEA complaint is received, the survivor is referred, the, the complaint is referred to the concerned entity, and the survivor has access to um, support and assistance. And that there is also the third part of that, um, the, the follow-up and investigation in accordance with a victim survivor-centered approach. So the idea of condensing down and updating the interagency CBCM in the past was to make sure that there is a standardized model of procedures. So this is a 10-page guidance that describes different scenarios that uh, people have come across that have been um, experienced at the 
at the country level and aimed to be able to standardize that for use as a template when many of you are being developing and working with country level SOPs so that there is procedures that are able to be adapted at the country level, but they all follow um, a standardized survivor centered approach for interagency referrals that are based on this agreed on um, shortened document at the HQ level. Next slide, thanks. So this is not to get into the details on this. The top line on this is really the ownership that it has across the interagency standing committee. So we have a lot of um, engagement in the process for the last eight months from NGO, INGO consortium. We have um, the IFRC, we have uh, extensive consultations with PSE coordinators, some of them who are sitting on the steering committee and others that we engage through the um, PCA coordinate network for those that are working um, in the field level. So it was also at the uh, final stages reviewed by the GBV AOR colleagues. We're really grateful to the input for that. And also we made sure that we integrated all the latest resources and have given the links to the appropriate guidance and updated SOPs for GBV as well. So this is not to say that this is the end of the process for this, but this is to show that the most important part when uh, people are working with this and trying to implement these guidance and procedures at the country level is that it has the buy-in um, very broadly across the ISC. In fact, it's going to the deputies in New York for endorsement, um, hopefully in the next two days, and so that we can then move on to the phase of supporting the implementation. We know that this has been for many, many years a very, very um, uh, challenging area. It hasn't had the best approach towards a survivor-centered approach in the past. There's been a lot of issues between organizations, between um, uh, different entities when it comes to how to receive complaints on how to refer with uh, making sure confidentiality, making sure safety of survivors, making sure they have access to services. And so really the top line here is that this should uh, um, mean that all uh, organizations working for the ISC, I ideally, um, uh, ISC members, sorry, they should be able to be uh, supporting this and supporting these procedures at the country level. If the next slide, thanks. So um, in terms of the most relevant parts of the uh, the guidance, it's very short, it's only 10 pages, as much as possible, it reflects existing guidance, um, but then it also um, updates. So I know many of you had um, a lot of roles in the past with the CBCM. The primary um, focus for GBV colleagues is to really make sure that there is um, that survivors are supported and promptly referred for assistance if requested as soon as they come forward with um, an SEA complaint. And that that is um, th that that they are dealt with by a trained person, a trained staff member, that they are able to make appropriate referrals, that they're uh, that they are being um, explained what informed consent is the if it's for the UN on, and others, uh, what the issues are around mandatory reporting, and that this is done safely, how their information is going to be used, what the next steps are, as well as making sure that they have immediate access to assistance if they wanted to access that. So that was really um, the, the main part in the guidance. The other part of the guidance is looking at different scenarios when it comes to who the alleged perpetrator is from. If that's from a government entity, um, a, a national government, what are the procedures with that? The leadership um, involvement and responsibility through the HCRC's office, the different roles of uh, the PSEA coordinator and uh, the different organizations that are members, for example, at that time of the PSEA network, depending on how that has been contextualized. Next slide, thanks. Um, this is just to say as well, one of the parts is to describe the roles and responsibilities. Nothing is new in this. It reflects the roles and responsibilities from um, uh, existing terms of reference, but it highlights their roles and responsibilities and where they can in, input and engage at the country level for the standard operating procedures at the country level. So in particular, um, looking from your perspective, I hope, uh, is the roles of the GBV and child protection coordinators um, to be able to work closely with the coordinators and the PSEA focal points to make sure that they understand the GBV and child protection referral pathway. So these are about assistance, uh, access to assistance um, for SEA survivors, and also to be able to make sure that the interagency SEA procedures um, and responding to SEA is integrated into the GBV SOPs that are, um, are relevant, and that uh, 
GBV and child protection service providers are trained in how to support SEA survivors. Now, um, my colleague Astrid was going to um, present on this today a little bit more. So if you've got questions on this, I think we can um, see how we're going to respond to that. Otherwise, it's good if uh, if Astrid is in, in the particular details of how this works. Next slide, thanks. So overall, just the main point here is in making sure that we integrated a survivor-centered approach into the referrals procedures. We didn't make any new policy on this. This has already been extensively worked on. Um, so we used very much the the wording and the, the, the spirit and the principles of the victim survivor-centered approach uh, set up by the Interagency Standard Committee. Anne-Marie has led on this in the past, and so I'm going to hand it over to her, but just to say that we integrated existing uh, agreed on materials and principles into this document and tried to bring them to life um, throughout this process, which hopefully is a huge improvement on the previous. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Christine. I hope everyone can see and hear me. Um, given time, I, I'll, I'll just really briefly um, reference the, the VCA work. So similarly to what Kirsty has indicated around the need for new uh, referral uh, mechanisms uh, through the external review, um, it was determined that the IASC um, needed um, a, a very clear um, victim survivor centered approach document that each of the IASC members could use. Um, so uh, also over the last year, we worked um, to develop uh, a definition and principles. You have, um, I've just put the link um, to that document in the chat um, and would be happy to, to speak to it in more detail um, at another time. Um, um, but just to highlight very briefly, as Kirsty has said, um, the, the, the first four principles are aligned with um, the GBV minimum standards um, in emergencies document, the, the latest uh, 2019. Um, uh, so uh, safety and security being the primary consideration um, for all of our work, whether it's the SERP um, or, um, or um, the, the VCA as a, as a whole. Um, the only other point I wanted to make here, and again, just for, for time is, um, Within the confidentiality principle, um, we've clearly outlined um, um, requirements around mandatory reporting. Um, and I, I simply wanted to um, highlight here that there's a lot of work happening around um, uh, mandatory reporting. We recognize that there continues to be tension um, between um, the, um, the, the a victim-centered approach and some of the requirements around mandatory reporting, there can be a tension there. Um, when when we knock up against those those two sometimes um, uh, conflicting um, principles, and there is a lot of work happening um, at the IASC level to to work through and have basic tools around around mandatory reporting. Again, um, there's a lot more to say around the VCA specifically, but I'll stop there um, so we have time for for some questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anne-Marie. And so to conclude then um, is really to say that getting the document endorsed or the guidance uh, note endorsed was really only the start of the process. The next stages will involve um, both GBV and AAP colleagues and PSEA colleagues in country as we support different um, countries in either updating their country level SOPs to be in line with these procedures or to be able to um, draft new uh, SOPs if uh, if they haven't already got them. So we're going to be supporting the, the country level SOPs. This is where some of the more uh, important detail is going to be um, fleshed out. And within that, of course, each country uh, office will have different referral pathways for child protection for GBV. And that's where um, it is really important that we get the collaboration of all colleagues um, working on the ground for that. So that will be our aim is to support that. We also are working on um, a process of representing um, interagency referrals from a survivor perspective. So this is really as much about the process as it is about the product. It's really looking at how organizations can understand how this 
uh, is experienced by a survivor, getting people to change their thinking away from their internal procedures or their investigations, but looking at the real challenges and bottlenecks that are experienced by survivors when they're going from different organizations, when there is a time lag because they don't hear back on investigations. Um, this doesn't perhaps concern GBV colleagues as much as it does once uh, these cases are referred within different UN agencies or different agencies or, or organizations. And here I just wanted to give credit to a CHS Alliance. They have been working on this extensively um, in, in the past and they have already put together a guidance um, not for interagency referrals, but really looking at this from a survivor-centered approach. So we have them leading on how we can adapt that to make sure we understand the bottlenecks and really use their experience that they've been working on at the country level to use the survivor-centered approach to understand how it can be improved uh, and how we can also change the policy in response. It's not always uh, the other way around. We need to be looking at some of our policy going forward when it comes to do with investigations and others about how we need to align that. So the procedures the guidance note that we've done is just really the first step in that. Um, and then the third part is obviously moving forward. This is one small piece of this. Um, how are we going to work together um, in the future to su support this? There's a vision um, outlined in the ISC PSEA um, revision that um, as all the all HCT um, countries will have a, um, a, a functioning, safe, um, appropriate referrals of SEA, um, a mechanism to be able to do that by 2026. I think that is something that is going to require, require a lot of support, but also understanding what the barriers to being able to achieve those are. Barriers for reporting from an AAP perspective, barriers for access to services. And so this is where we really need your engagement to be able to pinpoint, document what they are and make sure that we're following up in the ways that we're able to address that and support this at the country level. Um, thanks, Anne-Marie, for putting in the CHS guidance on this too. Uh, I'll stop now and uh, we haven't got so much time. If you put um, comments, uh, questions in the comments as well, if there's something that you want us to follow up on, we will get back to you on that. If you've got questions, we're happy to address those. So anything we can't cover today, drop us a line and Anne-Marie and I will um, we'll, uh, get back to you on it. And thank you so much for your time and already for your uh, your engagement in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you, Anne-Marie, for your presentation and also for putting the links into chat. And apologies again that Astrid could not be here, but uh, we can see if in the next calls, like next month, we can have a follow-up because this is still an ongoing discussion and it's good, good too, now that we have this guidance to keep the momentum. And maybe we can have the, the call to follow up on that part of the guidance too. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, Mirko, uh, is as it's written in the chat this uh, victim yeah the victim centered approach and as the GB community says survivor centered approach it has been an old issue in this case and it's really good to see now in the PSA documents survivor centered approach is being more pronounced and uh, we are from GVAR side we are also trying to see how this approach can be operationalized like through this guidance at the country level and uh, I'm just checking the chat to see if there is any question or comment. I don't know, uh, Mirko, if you want to also unmute yourself and about the comment you had. Okay. I'll just just responding very very briefly to to Mirko's comment. Fully agree, and and um, we want to ensure that any um, future operational tools um, are in line with um, a, a rights based approach. Thanks. Thank you so um, much. And so, what we're finding is that there's it's in a, it's quite a bit of circles that there's some issues relating whether these mandatory reporting and consent is conflicting, but they're not. They actually, they're rights based on due, on due process. And they're actually rights are meant to be complementary and re mutually reinforcing, not uh, conflicting with each other. So the idea is because it's so nuanced and because there's so many different um, situations for people, that it's our role, I think, to try to find how we can make the rights reinforce each other and not conflict. And that's gonna be a case by case situation. And many and many investigations and many responses. Um, that's simply because most of these most of this violence is is gender based on gender inequality and inequity. 
And as long as we're still there dealing with these with these issues, we're going to have to find ways to always uh, make sure that the guidance is always mutually reinforcing. Until we're we'll be able to properly embed a, um, a culture of prevention, then I think we'll find uh, that we don't have these conflicts anymore, but more so you will see that they'll naturally reinforce each other. But yeah, but first is really embedding a culture of prevention. Thanks very much for that. Thank you so much, Mirko. Yes, reconciling these principles is always a challenge, but it's good to see them as complementary, not conflicting. And there is another question about the translation of these resources, like in French, from Lara. I don't know, Christy or Anne-Marie want to respond to that? Yep, just to just to confirm that that process is that that is happening um, for both uh, the VCA and and for um, the the referrals. Great, thank you so much. Any other comment or question? Please feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat. Okay, all UN languages, great, thank you so much. And we also make sure that we send them through our newsletter once we receive them. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to all presenters and for to all of you for joining. It was a really great session. And if you do not have any more comment or question, I think we can close the call. Great, many thanks. We will share the record. How is this going to be disseminated? We have one last question. <laughs> the guidance, uh, it will it will be available on the uh, Interagency Standing Committee website. And I'm sure we can share, I know with that, like all of the documents are including uh, the VCA as well. So it will be available in different languages on the ISC PSEA website, but we'll definitely give you a link to that so you can send it out. Thanks, yes. everybody, for we your also time. send it out from our site. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank Wishing you. you all a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for your time.